Thank you for joining me for uh, another episode of Casual Conversations. Today, I am here with a new friend, Bob Stonehill. We have connected through a mutual passion for uh, process improvement and just all things innovative and how to do things better. Bob uh, has made a career out of process improvement, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, Bob has been with uh, uh, Pfizer and Fortis. And Bob, a question. I see this company everywhere. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Is it Pfizer? It's Pfizer, short for financial services. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense, Bob. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. So um, Bob is also a, uh, a, a published writer and has a career history in academics. And we'll talk all about that. So Bob, before I get too far into the weeds of who are you, I really like to pose that question to you. Um, tell the folks that are watching, who is Bob and why are we here talking today? Great. Well, first of all, I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you, John. Um, you know, I started my career a number of years ago. Um, you know, I actually started in as a machine operator and worked my way up through the ranks um, running a production floor. And uh, I've run just about every department uh, before becoming a general manager, um, having full P&L responsibility. Uh, I've had up to 12 different people, direct reports, other managers, and um, facility size approximately 250 or so in direct reports. Uh, my, my experience has been primarily in the printing industry and uh, various iterations of that. Um, and, and I think shortly after I started my career, I became very observant to what I felt were, um, managers that were rather difficult to deal with. And, and strangely enough, I, I learned a great deal from them. And actually I learned how not to manage people from them. So, uh, that led me on a, um, uh, sort of a journey to, um, look at the cultural aspects of getting people motivated, um, you know, increasing and raising their level of performance. Uh, I'm a coach and a mentor. And um, I guess the the boring part is I'm certified lean and a Six Sigma black belt. My leadership style is uh, one of servant leadership. I feel it's my job to remove barriers for people to better do their job. And um my ego, I think at this point, is somewhat in the back seat because I, my proudest moments are watching others ascend and achieve uh, that I'm associated with. Thanks for that, Bob. So uh, if anybody watching has followed me for any length of time, Bob's answer to that should not be any surprise as to why we connected. Um, this is something I write about on a regular basis, something I believe in as well. And what's funny, uh, Bob, what we share in common is uh, I have learned how to be a better leader from some of the worst leaders that I've ever come across. And it, to me, that is, uh, it's a sad place to be that, um, but it's happening still today. There are still bad leaders out there um, that, you know, I, I think they just don't know any better. They haven't had the right teacher. They haven't had the right mentor. They haven't had the right uh, people in their circle to tell them, why are you doing it that way? So I appreciate you uh, bringing that up, Bob. Um, you know, and I think you've you've uh, downplayed a little bit um, your your past. So I'll be the one to put it out there. You know, Bob has a stellar executive career of fixing broken systems, fixing broken pro processes, and not just uh, fixing them in the moment so that the the mission could be achieved. Um, but I've I've had some time to do some research into Bob's career. And um, the reason that, uh, you know, Bob has the certifications that he does have is because he believes in not just fixing it, but solving it, making sure that uh, the generation that comes behind him can take it even further and not have an easier path. That's not why Bob does what he does. Um, but he believes in uh, really moving through the problems so they're no longer problems and making sure that when that next generation steps up and gets their opportunity, everything that Bob had to deal with 
is no longer even a concern. It's a learning lesson and he's documented it. Uh, and he's got a, a great track record of documenting why things should be done properly and not just why things should be done, but very specifically in his industry, um, Bob has documented in you know process improvements that have saved these companies millions and millions of dollars. So uh, Bob is super humble and won't brag about himself. So um, I'll, I'll try to fill in those blanks. So Bob, uh, one of the things that was cool to me when we talked the first time was um, you, you took a stumble down an academic path. Can you talk to us about um, how that happened, some of the experiences and what led to um, you essentially documenting your visions and theories um, to be published? Well, that's a really a great question. And, and I appreciate you articulating what I was um, probably too modest to, to uh, waste your time on. But um, yeah, I had quickly found that, gee, I'm going to need this certification. Um, and I, I became uh, certified in, with a black belt uh, in Six Sigma. And I, one of the first things I think that I noticed was uh, the book that I used to study was like, you know, 1,200 pages. And one of the things that became very apparent to me um, in, in my past was what the culture was like. And out of the 1,800 or so pages of this book, um, there was only like a page and a half devoted to the culture. And I found that very perplexing. Um, and then the more I got into um, uh, studying it and then putting it into practice, I also was reading that most of these efforts fail. And I wondered like, well, why would they fail? Well, they fail because um, most of the time, it's kind of a new buzzword now that's picking up a lot of steam and leadership, which I would tell you most leaders become leaders because of their financial and maybe technical prowess. And maybe the backseat on what they refer to, this is another Thing that bothers me, but they refer to people skills as soft skills. And I think they're only soft skills because uh, they can't master them. Um, they tend to discount them and feel maybe it's somebody else's job or, hey, we'll just get somebody else. Um, it is extremely important that attention be paid to the folks on the floor because 90% of the time they see the things going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And I feel that um, a lot of times no one's really listening to them or giving them uh, a voice. And that essentially is what I do. So um, where I take the companies I've been with from a group of people that maybe see stupid things going on, they complain about them, nobody really listens, they tend to check out. Um, I come along and I'm actually listening to people. So again, one of the things I, I talk about is communication. Hey, we're talking. But a good 75 to 90 percent of communication is actually listening. So one of the things I do when I first come on board is I, I circulate a questionnaire. I do it on a one on one basis. But I ask the people on the floor, what are the top three issues that are facing the facility in your point of view? My follow up is how do you view your role in fixing the problems that you've just uh, initiated? Now, it takes you from being a complainer to someone that now has a voice. And I tend to, I'm a collaborative problem solver. Yes, I make decisions. I'm certainly not afraid of making them. Um, but I feel certain structural ones need involvement from the folks on the floor. And that engages people. It motivates them. And now you're seeding the environment. So one of the metaphors I like to use uh, that I've mentioned to you, John, is going on a vacation, uh, let's say to a, a beautiful exotic place, seeing a plant that's absolutely gorgeous. You're taken in by it and you bring it home to your house in like Connecticut, put it in the ground and in a couple of days it dies. Well, the metaphor there certainly is that just because you've seen something that works and it works really well and that's what you want, unless you see the proper environment for it to thrive, it's going to die. And I think that um, folks like me, I've been talking about this. I wrote my ebook about constructive culture over 10 years ago um, when no one was really talking about it. 
so when I when I stumble across folks like you, um, it it almost makes me feel like I've been living in a foreign country, speaking in a language that not too many people understand, and all of a sudden I meet somebody who's speaking my language. So we connected and hit it off for that reason. <laughs> I appreciate that analogy. And I, you know, what's funny, Bob, is um, I love your analogies because I do them myself. Um, you know, and of course, from the problem solving mindset, I think to myself, okay, how can I tell this story in a way that gets what's going on up here, out here, where everybody understands how crazy I am up here? with and I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at things and saying, how can I make that better? How can I fix that? Um, so I, I want to talk just a little bit about you know, the soft skills thing. And you you have presented an interesting theory. Um, and I don't I don't think you're wrong. Um, you know, because what it boils down to is it boils down to human relationships. And that's something that not everybody is good at and you're right uh it's what, what i i have never thought about that that throwing a label on it uh is what people do when they don't know how to do it um yeah or you know just the opposite when someone's trying to sell a solution to a problem they'll throw a label on it um, but that is really you know soft skills does boil down to how well do you actually relate to other people and how can you how you tell your story in my opinion uh, so I think that's a, a very valuable point uh, before we get too far into it one thing I did fail to mention is one of the reasons that Bob and I are here today to talk is not just because it fills my ego because I get to talk to somebody who speaks my language and we can bounce ideas off each other and agree with everything the other one says um, but Bob is also at a transition point in his career, um, still looking to give back to his industry. Uh, Bob is recently relocated to the Nashville area. Um, but, you know, Bob, one of the questions I don't think I've asked you so far in our previous conversations, um, are you interested in relocating or traveling? Yeah, so for me, um, the number one um, thing that I'm looking for is a good fit. You know, I want somebody that values some of the things that we're speaking about. And um, it is not only looking for uh, positive change uh, and a constructive culture, but um, someplace that I can really sink my teeth into. So from a, a business perspective, yeah, I mean, I'm not averse to going anywhere. Um, this At this point in my career, um, the fit is most important where it is is secondary. Okay, that that's perfect. So um, I know you've done some time on the West Coast and you came back and you've got family in the Nashville area. Um, if there were a place, um, uh, obviously having family there in the Nashville area, I would think that would be your first choice that, hey, if I could stay here, be around my grandkids, that'd be perfect. However, from the selfish side of you, I'd say, is there an ideal location that you'd like to go? Well, of course, uh, Nashville would be great. Um, uh, I came here 16 years ago. Um, but I I guess the South is probably a preference, although, again, um, the position and the opportunity is my number one factor. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think those <laughs> – I wouldn't expect anything less from a career problem solver but to say, you know, what I'm doing, how I'm contributing is the most important. Um, you know, adding value is, is super important. It's kind um, of a sickness with me, John, and maybe you could identify with this. Um, I really thrive in a hectic environment. I love being pulled in different directions. And if I had a job of just sitting behind a desk all day and not interacting on the floor, helping people, uh, that wouldn't be a good fit for me. So, uh, you know, I want to back up a second if I can. Absolutely. Because you touched, you touched on something, you know, with the people side of it. Um, what I've found is that um, a lot of folks that ascend through the ranks to the management position, um, a lot of them have done it because of their industry knowledge. And th they're really great from a production perspective. And then they get into the leadership role and, and they fail. And um, I've seen that all too often. So 
when I got to Pfizer, I would tell you, I did not know the plastic card industry. Um, my hiring manager felt that I had what he called the transferable skills or the leadership skills they looked for regarding cultivating the, the uh, culture. And that's how I made my mark. But it put me in an interesting position because what happened was uh, I came into a facility where there are people there for like 10 and 20 years. And here I am coming in uh, and, and I'm seeing waste as a, a lean, um, you know, certified lean Six Sigma black belt. I'm seeing waste everywhere. My, my, my real job was how do I get them to see it and not alienate them in the process? Because, you know, once you've failed, now you have to overcome the failure and then get people to get past the, yeah, we've tried that and it didn't work routine. Um, so I did something that was rather unconventional, which is kind of me. Um, I had a town hall and I put up on uh, the screen for a tenth of a second, an optical illusion, which you're probably familiar with. Luckily, <clears throat> these folks weren't. And, you know, it's a wine goblet with the two faces looking in at it. It's a black and white image. Put it up there real quick, asked everybody what they saw. And people focused on the black image. A couple of people started saying, they saw the reverse image and I let them argue for a few minutes. I put it up on the screen and I left it there. And quickly the discussion shifted from, well, now I can't unsee that. And how come I never noticed it before? Well, it was a perfect segue for me to tell them, let me tell you what I see that's going on here and I need your help to fix it. So what happened was I needed their industry knowledge and they needed my leadership and direction. And, it, you know, actually coming in with what works and what doesn't might not have caught on to this uh, as well as it did. You know, uh, Bob, that I'm, I'm thank thank you for telling that story. And it, it is actually a part of your story that you've written uh, in, in the document that you sent me that, that you published. Um, and I've actually said this multiple times <laughs> through my career, uh, as I've had to reinvent myself, uh, I, I, my, my track record for the past 30 years is logistics. However, I have had some detours along the way where I've stepped out to do something that was not logistics. And that, that question had always popped up was, well, you know, you're a logistics guy. How are you going to go sell that? Well, because they're going to trust me more than they trust you. You're a career sales guy. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to talk about the features and benefits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same thing. The value. Happened. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, a as I transitioned through several careers, it was kind of just like what you talk about is I'm not the expert in the room on how the industry works. I'm the expert in the room on how things work, how right. people work. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that that's really one of the benefits, a strong benefit that you bring to any organization is that you don't have to be an expert on what they do because it doesn't matter the widget you're producing. Uh, there's going to be industry specific things that industry experts exist for, but process procedure and human relationships really boil down to a, a couple key, very specific factors um, that I, you know, I think uh, if you are in the Nashville area and you're looking for someone with Bob's skill set, number one, I'd recommend um, go research him and you're going to find out he's a very straight shooter, a guy who um, if he tells you that he accomplished this, he actually accomplished this, but he doesn't want to tell you about this part because he's too <laughs> proud. Um, so um, mm. Bob, if you wouldn't mind, um, can you walk us through the transition um, between, you know, from your last two roles and how that came about? Sure. Um, well, with Pfizer, they went through a merger. Um, and during that merger, uh, they came on with a company that had a larger manufacturing space. We were the manufacturing hub for several facilities that did the personalization on the cards. Um, and eventually, uh, a lot of the management in that space, um, you know, were, were replaced. And in the printing industry, consolidation is kind of the name of the game. Um, without getting too uh, into the weeds, 
uh, there were some things that happened in my last position that I came into that uh, from an ethical perspective, I, um, I could not it, it ascribe to them and I resigned. Um, I felt that um, my uh, integrity and my peace of mind was probably um, more important than uh, being in an environment that I, I felt was caustic. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough decision to make. Um, yes, sir. You, you know, and, and a lot of people, quite frankly, they won't make it. A lot of people will just do what they're told um, because they're afraid to make that change. So uh, kudos to you for having the courage to make that change and, and to move on. Um, and so when you left Fiserv, um, the, the next role that you had, was it, how, how similar was it? Um, it was very, um, very much different. Um, the, the facility or the, um, the company had just made a purchase of uh, two other companies that were basically diametrically op opposed in the packaging industry. Um, one was all digital and the other one was more or less traditional. Um, so I think they hired me in knowing that uh, how do we pull these folks in from a culture perspective? And that was kind of my main focus. Um, so together there were three individual facilities and, um, and I, I, I really thought that this was going to be it, you know, it, it was, uh, an opportunity for me to do, you know, what I would really love to do. And that is bring people together and pull them all on board. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to digress back to, uh, just to mention to you and, uh, because you hit on it was, the metaphor and the storytelling, and I talk about this in my book as being extremely important, um, mostly because I hit on something I wasn't really aware of. You know, when I told like five people something that I wanted to do, I was getting like seven or eight versions of what I said coming back to me. And I always found that fascinating. And I tell a little story, it goes into more depth about it in the book, but the short and the long of it is, People process information differently. So unless you are willing and you are aware of that, we're all looking at things through our own lens. And although you perfectly understand what you just said, there are other people that are on different points along the way that are going to filter out all the things that you said that you might have felt were important and focus in on maybe one thing and twist it into something that they can understand. So I found telling a story, using humor, um, you know, these things actually build trust and also enable you to speak to a larger group of people and have something more readily acceptable. I used visual aids at times. Um, I had a situation where I had two groups within the, within, uh, the company that were pulling against each other. And I came up with a way of dealing with this that you know, we had talked to them individually. It wasn't working. Uh, you know, the Chinese torture things, you put your finger in each end and, you know, you go to try to get out of them. Yes. Well, a lot of them weren't familiar with it, but I handed it out to a group of people that were in the opposite camps, told them to put their fingers in it and said, okay, try to get out. Well, they do the normal thing and they try pulling apart. And what I said to them was, you notice the harder you pull, the harder it is to get out. Well, so I'm going to tell you something that doesn't make any sense logically, but works. You need to push to closer together, and that will ease it so that you can then pull your fingers out. Well, it worked. And I said, we're working against one another, and we need to work together in order to achieve this goal. I can't tell you what lights went on in people's heads. And that's the kind of thing I do, and I'd love to do it. Uh, there's psychology involved. Yeah, you know, um, I, I I have a similar story of a team building exercise that, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I joined a team years and years ago, and quite frankly, I didn't trust anybody on the team, and it was very obvious. Uh, the leader called me in several times, essentially to say to me. Um, you're not even giving them a chance. You're not trusting them. And these were all my peers. And we all operated departments that functioned off of each other. And uh, 
you know, so he said, you know, you're a very suspicious person. You're always doubting what other people's motives are. And uh, when that didn't work, he took us out to a trust building exercise. And one of these exercises was we had to climb a pole that was being supported by ropes being held by the peers. And I thought to myself, for sure, I'm like, these guys are not going to hold that steady for me. Um, and I, I think there were 16 of us and we're all climbing this pole. This pole is literally being supported. And it was a, I think a 15 foot pole. So if you fall off, you got to mm. hope they catch you. Yep. And, but if you get all the way to the top, you, and th this pole, Bob, it was probably that deep in diameter. Um, you get to the top, you're supposed to stand on it and then jump and swing down off of another rope. Um, now, obviously, there were safety devices in play because the company didn't want to get sued for injuries. But um, <clears throat> when it became my turn, I just said to myself, well, the Army put me through much worse. And if I get to the top of that, this is my team and they're going to support me. But if they don't get to the top of it, it will be on me and I will get or if, if they don't support me, and don't hold it up. I am at least going to go out in a blaze of glory that I tried my hardest. And Bob, I scaled that thing. You know, I was much younger and more fit back then. Mm -hmm. I, I scaled that thing, got to the top, jumped off. Everything went great. And, you know, in my own mind, I, I, I think and I felt like they held it tighter for me because they knew that I didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. um, but it was funny because from that day moving forward, a very solid relationship. Um, you know, and you know, I'm friends with a lot of those people to this day. And it really mm -hmm. took that team building exercise for me to earn that trust with them. And I think it's interesting, you know, you, you talk about this, uh, the Japanese torture device, you know, and, and, and sometimes, and I think you know this, sometimes it's not even the activity that's teaching them the lesson. Sometimes that uh, you know, that icebreaker or that, that break to do something different is also sure. resetting their mindset and getting them, you know, refocused on what am I even doing here? Why, why mm -hmm. am I sitting in this room? Uh, so I think it has a lot of value. I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ego and um, psychology that goes into how do you make a process better? How do you make a team function better together? Um, and again, I will go back to the human skills and building a relationship. Uh, I'm going to try not to use the word soft skills for, for the rest of this chat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, and one of the things I spoke to you about was as a, as a leader or as a, uh, a lean uh, expert, uh, coming up with the answer to a problem isn't necessarily going to fix the problem. And the key is implementation. So, if you, if you can come up with the answer, but if you can't implement it, it's going to basically die. And the one of the keys to implementing it is the need to see the folks that will be working with it every day have the input. You know, um, you, you might not necessarily do what they want, but just to have them be a part of that process is what engages people. And I also have a um, kind of a unconventional way to get people like one of the things that I'm asked is, how do you get that guy that like always is a problem, no matter what you want to do, he's you know going to tell you it's not going to work. So and this doesn't work all the time, but it worked for me a lot of times. You know, there's one guy that no matter what happens, he's going to tell you it's not going to work. You know, and sometimes it's because they've been there a while and they haven't been a part of what's going on. They have four or five other guys that cling to them, to, to this guy, and he's their mouthpiece, you know, but they feel the same way. So you break this up by having them actually lead a team. You know, they have a problem in their area. They're now the leader of the team. And the folks that are the other naysayers will follow suit and now he has a stake in whether it, it works or not because, you know, he's in the limelight and it usually works. Um, I would tell you also the teams that I formulate never have a manager or supervisor leading them. It gives me a chance to see other people in different roles. And one of the things that I value greatly is the ability to see where somebody um, would be better off in, in a different position. Um, and, and I kind of give them that opportunity. 
Yeah, yeah, we we do all know that guy. I think I've written about that guy a couple times. Um, Sometimes he doesn't make it, you know. Sometimes, yeah. hey, you know, when you got to cut him loose. So, um, Bob, I was curious. The ebook is it published anywhere where people can find it? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, and and uh, if I quickly just mention how it came about, yeah, um, I, I I had I was lucky to have breakfast with a professor at uh, Vanderbilt University who was teaching a systems design engineering course to very gifted engineering students. Uh, I was looking for a recent grad to join up in the company and I got to tell him my philosophy and he, you know, he was rather excited and he said, would you do me a favor and lecture to my class? So I thought me lecture to engineers. Well, um, okay. So I, I did it, you know, the first couple of times I did it, um, actually ended up doing it for like eight, eight plus years, all through, you know, the various um, uh, different times of the year. But um, so the first couple of times he said, you know, your, your ideas are very different and, but you're bringing in other people's books. You need to write your own book. And I said, well, you know, if you write the introduction of liner notes, I'll, I'll write the ebook. And he did indulge me with that. And of course, he's written the, the liner notes to it. And I wrote it. It's kind of a treatise. I probably ought to make it into a full-blown book, you know. But if you go on Amazon and do a search for Bob Stonehill, you'll find Constructive Culture, the Forgotten Business Metric, all of $2.99. Thank you for the shameless plug. Um, and of course, you know, culture isn't a metric, but I could tell you if you have a bad one or a caustic one, you will find the evidence of it uh, all throughout your PL on every line item. So, uh, Bob, thank you for that shameless plug. I'll go ahead and throw that yes. link uh, everywhere this <laughs> video is seen. Um, so, if they want to track you down, Bob, how what's the best way for someone to find you? Well, uh, through LinkedIn is probably the best way. Reach out and connect with me. You can write me an e email or um, you can get me at stonyhill at hotmail.com, which is, I better spell it for you because even that's different. It's S-T-O-N-Y-H-I-L, just one L, at hotmail.com. My phone number is 615-429-6806. Uh, well, that, that that was probably the boldest move I've ever seen someone do is yep. give out their cell phone number on a YouTube video. There you go. Uh, but I'll go ahead and plug that cell phone number in uh, to the comments as well. Uh, and I think that's a bold statement for a guy who's looking to make your organization just a little bit better. And so um, please, if you have uh, openings, uh, definitely consider Bob for those. Check out his resume. Check out his LinkedIn page. Uh, obviously, you can tell Bob is an open book, uh, pardon the pun, uh, but um, you can find his book. You can talk to the guy. Uh, his ideas are worth hearing, and he will absolutely add value. Bob, I'm very grateful that you gave me the opportunity today to talk to you and that you uh, were patient enough to deal with my uh, my strict recording standards, and so I'm, I'm grateful no. for that. Not at all. Um, listen, pleasure is mine, John. And uh, again, uh, finding somebody that speaks your language, um, I, I can't tell you what that does to me. I feel vindicated in so many ways, and I've learned a great deal from you. I think it's all part of uh, learning and exchanging uh, for all of us to, uh, you know, the betterment of our lives. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I'm, I, I feel like I'm the one who's grateful here, so I appreciate the compliment. Uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram um, by searching me at Get Doolin. You can also find me at uh, my website, getdoolin.com. Uh, I will say I'm on Twitter, but I'm not really on Twitter. Um, I do my best to keep up the page, but it's not really my jam. Um, so, um, Thank you for watching. Very grateful for the opportunity to bring Bob uh, to your device today. And if you are a company or an employer who is looking for someone with Bob's skill set who can help you transform your organization, uh, turn it profitable, turn it productive, um, 
there's plenty of ways that you can just look down in the comments section of this video or wherever you find this video posted, look in the comments section. Bob's contact information is right there. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you.